once again to Daily Manor, this beautifully prepared presentation brought to you each day, Monday through Saturday, by way of St. Mark Emmy Church here in Orlando. That's designed to help you to feed your faith and starve your doubts. We provide you a nugget of wisdom that can be made applicable to your daily uh, agenda for your meal and your life journey. And as you all know, we're thankful for uh, Anthony Russell, who taught us last week, and Jeff Beeson the week before, uh, and just celebrate their participation in allowing us to convey God's word and to continue these opportunities to encourage your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, well, I'm back, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to be teaching continuously inside of the book of Romans, and we are Right now at chapter number six, we are at verse 15, and I ask for you to join us as we look at verses 15 through 22. The Bible says, what then shall, what then? shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? The response, by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from the sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus far, the word of God. I want to begin by having an opportunity to give an affirmation to help you to hear the argument inside of chapter number six is it bouncing around this whole idea of grace versus law, law versus grace. And then you start hearing Paul shift it to discuss grace versus sin or basically obedience and sin. The whole mindset is here's the objective what Paul is basically showing us is that the law at one point is representing an old uh, means by which one ascertain right relations with God. Grace is now the new form of relationship that is gained through God. I have therefore gained a relationship with God through grace where in the old paradigm I gained relationship with God by way of the law that needs to be understood at the get-go. Then he turns around and he flips it and he puts in two additional words that are designed to be, you know, uh, antonyms. They're, 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 they're anti to each other. And those words become obedience versus sin. See, he starts adding these words to us to allow us to see the difference between grace and law, obedience and sin. Here's what Bonhoeffer, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer said about grace. He, tells, he came up with a phrase called cheap grace, which signifies that one has no appreciation for the death nor the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that it did cost something for humanity to be saved and for humanity to behave as if that there was no cost and that there was no sacrifice and to therefore forget or to dismiss that ultimate sacrifice is ultimately a way to cheapen and diminish and put down grace. I wish to say to you 
that as Paul is writing this sixth chapter, he's trying to convey to us the necessity to watch, to see, to observe that we ought to carry ourselves differently because grace ought not be played down. Grace ought not just be something that we take lightly, but rather something that we wholeheartedly find ourselves embracing to allow others to see that grace is something achieved. Yes, we've been given time, a loving forgiveness of extension of life. Well, God gave us that, but don't make that something and that is our right. It's not our right. It is something God has freely given to us. It's not your right to have it. God has chosen to graciously and kindly extend it and never act as if you would do it. As a matter of fact, all of us on a regular basis ought to wake up with an appreciation for the fact that God gave us another chance. Bass grace. Bass grace. Bass grace. The extension of time. Because again, in the Old Testament, when a sin was committed and the people caught them, that which was enacted was immediate judgment. In essence, they were taken outside of the community in which they lived and they were eradicated, they were stoned, they were killed, they were cut off from the lineage of the children of Israel. That was how they functioned. That was the law. And now we see something called grace. We see grace enacted inside of the Gospels when we watch Jesus, when they bring the woman who was caught, quote unquote, in the act of adultery. They caught the woman but didn't catch the man. When the woman was caught in the act of adultery, Jesus, who was kneeling down, stood up and made this pronounced statement after hearing them say, according to the law of Moses, if someone's caught in the act of adultery, they should be stoned. And Jesus stood up and said, ye that are without sin, cast the first stone. Which meant Jesus got involved enough to say, if you therefore are without sin, throw the first one, go, go throwing your rocks. And the Bible shows us that from the eldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones and they walked away. Jesus, who had knelt back down, gets up again and looks at the woman and says, where are your accusers? And they are not there. And Jesus says, neither shall I accuse you. Go your way and sin no more. Some kind of way, the conversation with Jesus shows us is that grace is extended from the standpoint that no, if you going to be the ones to therefore pronounce judgment, if you going to be judge and jury, of humanity, then you need to make sure your hands are cleansed, thus allowing us to see that no one can judge but the Father. And that's why we hear stuff like, let the wheat and the tear grow up together, because in the day of harvest, the Bible says, I'll do the separation, which means let the judgment stay in the hands of the righteous. And the only one that is perfect enough to pronounce judgment on anybody is the Father. Even Jesus says none is perfect but the Father. So which allows us to come back to Paul's conversation. Paul who argues this ideology over against what we call grace and law or law versus grace to show us the disparity and the difference between the two. And then he turns around and says something about obedience over against sin. And here's interesting, interesting enough what Paul does. He says, you're going to be a slave. This is what he says in the writing. Read it again. You're going to be a slave to one of them. You're either going to be a slave to sin or you're going to be a slave to obedience. It's your choice. He basically shows us, but if you're a slave to sin, it leads to death. But if you're a slave to obedience, it leads to righteousness. In essence, he basically is telling us you're going to follow some voice. You're going to follow some action. You got to make sure you understand the end result of that which you make your allegiance to. If you are lead, alleged or make your allegiance to that which is the flesh, then to the flesh you will therefore find yourself sowing. And from the flesh you will find yourself reaping. If you sow unto obedience, it is through obedience that you will reap the harvest, that you will sow your seeds and reap your harvest. Paul so tells us it is one of the two arms, but knowing this, you are a slave 
to one of them. And he comes back and therefore gives us this culminating verse that jumps out at all of us. All of us have learned this verse at some point in time in our lives. For the wages, in essence, since you have been a slave and actively engaged in working, either to sin or to obedience, I need you to know your payday is coming. For the wages of sin is death. In essence, that's exactly what you worked for. You worked to basically be a sinner. You were obligated to sin. You were a slave to sin. And the payment for that sin is death but the gift. In essence, because you were obedient, because you followed what God says, the gift of God is eternal life. Here it is. One is a wage. One is a gift. And therefore, we understand grace is God's gift. And since grace is God's gift, and since God has graciously given us his son, has given us the Holy Spirit, why not operate in the area of his giftedness over against being paid for behavior that leads to eternal death? Well, children of God, I leave you reminding and asking you, what do you want? Do you want to find yourself abiding in law or do you want grace? Do you want obedience or do you want sin? You're going to serve one or the other. And in the words of the wonderful uh, heir leader of the children of Israel who took over after Moses, whose name was Joshua, choose you this day uh, the God you're going to serve. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. i rather hold on to grace and trust and obey. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of word, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. But until then, know that I love you, and God bless.